Hello, everybody, and welcome to Arrived Market Spotlight featuring Atlanta, Georgia today. Would love to hear where you all are tuning in from. Feel free to drop it in the chat. I am tuning in from gloomy Seattle, but no complaints over here. Would love to hear where you all are tuning in from. We'll give folks a few more moments here uh, before we get started with our prepared remarks. Welcome, Kristen, Philip, Remington. Great to see you. Gloomy SoCal, we're, we're alike right now. Philadelphia, welcome John from DC. David from rainy LA. Lots of California folks in the house. ATL, love to see it. Helen from Dover, New Jersey. Greg from Greenville. Philip, 70 degrees and sunny. Sounds wonderful. We've got Jeff in the chat, our very own, who will be on today from Las Vegas. <laughs> Javier from Orlando, New Jersey in the house. Welcome, Jose. Awesome. We'll give it a, a, about 30 more seconds here for folks to jump in. Um, and then we will dive into the market spotlight featuring Atlanta, Georgia. We have great prepared remarks for you all today. Craig from Chicago, welcome. We'll give it about 15 more seconds here. Wonderful. Welcome, Brandon from Atlanta. Great to have you here. Ooh, Joe from Seattle. We've got a neighbor in the house. Columbia, welcome. Stephen from Connecticut. Wonderful. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, everybody, welcome to Arrived Spot Market Spotlight today featuring Atlanta, Georgia. Before we get started, we'll do quick intros. Again, my name is Corinne Headland. I lead our investor relations team here at Arrived. We have Jeff Talbert, our Director of Investment Valuation, and then Cameron Wu, our VP of Investments here at Arrived. A quick agenda just to lay, give a lay of the land for today. We'll briefly walk through a market overview of Atlanta, existing portfolio, so those properties that are currently fully funded, and then our newest offerings that we have coming down the pipeline, and then live Q&A. So feel free to drop any questions that you have in the chat. We will also have Jake P, our head of operations, who will be answering those questions or teeing them up for live Q&A after prepared remarks. So I'm gonna go ahead and welcome Cameron Wu, our VP of Investments up to the stage. Hey everyone, how you doing? Thanks, Corinne. So excited for you all to join us today. Thanks so much for joining, um, taking time for your day. So we're excited to spotlight Atlanta, Georgia. It's a market that we have invested in um, since the beginning uh, of arrived. So we'll go through our portfolio. We'll go through our market, our thesis on why we like the market, and then just going to talk through more of the portfolio. Um, that we've built, the portfolio that we're bringing to market uh, with the current drop and the coming soon properties. Um, and then from there, we'll take live Q&A. Um, happy to answer all questions related to investing, arrived, Atlanta, these specific properties. Um, so we'd love to hear from you all. So let's talk a little bit about the market, Atlanta. So a lot of times when we're picking markets, we focus on the macro. So it's like, what is the demand? Uh, it kind of starts with the population, the movement of people. So right now, the MSA of Atlanta is about 6 million people, and a lot of it is suburbs, right? Um, so it's projected to grow to about 8 million by 2040. So one third of the population, um, you know, is expect additional population is, ex is expected to come. So a lot of growth there. It's already the eighth or ninth largest MSA in the country. So in terms of the southeast portion, you know, it's one of the largest. Um, the biggest employer there is the airport. So it is the Hartfield Jackson International Airport, and it is the transportation hub of the Southeast and really the Western Hemisphere, right? So if you look at um, airport volume by passengers, Atlanta is third behind um, only a couple in China, which not, you know, not surprising given that they have close to one and a half billion people. Um, so certainly an impressive, uh, part of the economy. It employs 63,000 people. So certainly brings a lot of life and vitality to the area. It's also got the third largest number of fortune 500 companies headquartered there. So it's home Depot, Coca-Cola, Delta airlines is some uh, among some of the largest, 
Um, but but I was surprised to learn that it had that much fundamental economic diversity there when we were doing the market research before um, entering into Atlanta. Um, now let's go over some of the residential dynamics there because it's really key to part of the, the thesis of why we invest in Atlanta and why we're bullish on it long term. So the residential dynamics, obviously it's got the population growth going for it. But what's interesting about Atlanta, Georgia is that it has a very high percentage of rentership. So about 55% of all single family homes are rented in the Atlanta market compared to the national average of about, um, what is it? Uh, 35%. So there's a much higher proportion of rentership in Atlanta, which has a couple of um, lasting impacts. One, the demand for rentals there is quite high. So operating those as investments um, for long-term rentals is a pretty good and stable model as there's always you know, population growth and demand for that type of asset. Um, the second is kind of support. So a lot of uh, support for the asset class. A lot of the homes are owned by what are called institutional owners. So they're larger companies. You, you may have heard of some of them, American Homes for Rent, um, Invitation Homes, uh, Progress Residential, among others. Those are some of the largest um, in the space. But Atlanta does have a high proportion of that institutional ownership. Now, is that good or is that bad? You know, those kind of tints aside, what it does provide is support for the market. So those institutional owners are very long-term owners um, of those homes. They professionally manage them for cash flow on a really long-term basis. So there's not as much buying and selling and you know systemic risk involved with that. Basically, you have a strong buyer to support the floor. And when you think about how big of a market it is, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in Atlanta to invest in these properties because we have a little bit more price stability. We have high demand for rentals. And, you know, just that interesting dynamic about um, how the city's built, it's very much a suburban, uh, a suburban MSA. 500,000 people live in Atlanta, the city, and then 6 million people live in the MSA. So that means 5.5 million people live in pretty much suburbs or like smaller towns. Um, so anyway, that just kind of paints the picture of why Atlanta, strong fundamental economy, diversified, um, population growth, big, uh, you know, the, the airport and all those fortune 500 companies and a high proportion of rentership. So all of that influences where we buy, what kind of properties we buy. And then, you know, I'm going to welcome Jeff now on stage to go over our portfolio. So he'll show you where the distribution of properties are that kind of corroborate the story of a suburban sprawl with strong economics, um, for the long-term rental model. So why don't you come on up, Jeff? Thank you, Cameron. Okay. So as Cam said, just want to spend a little bit of time going through uh, our existing portfolio in Atlanta. Uh, for longer term investors, you know that we have been buying here for a lot of the reasons Cam was talking through. Um, so you'll see uh, a pretty clear uh, circle almost. Um, it's more of a half circle, but a, a circle around the, the city itself. So we are buying um, mostly to the south and west of town. Um, our new our new portfolio ads um, this week also reflect that. Um, suburban sprawl is a really is a really key dynamic and is a is a really good growth area for Atlanta. You know, you really see a lot of demands for people moving down here um, and getting bigger lots, um, you know, houses with fenced yards and things like that. So this is kind of where you want to be in Atlanta. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. So here are our new ones. Uh, these are the homes that are part of the drop today. Um, as you'll see, there's there's seven dots here or seven uh, marks here. Um, again, it's typically going to be in the suburban areas. It's going to be to the south uh, primarily. Um, also, we have one over there in the east and a couple to the west. Um, this is really kind of where you want to continue to add. This is to Cam's point where the demand is in the Atlanta area. Um, and I'm actually going to show you in the next couple slides, I'm going to show you some of the key distinctions um, between what we have been buying here and what this batch represents. So as you can see, this is not too much of a departure from our normal spread. Um, you know, if these were all the same color, I don't think you'd be able to pick out, you know, these seven from the whole portfolio. So in general, these are pretty much the same areas we've been buying. Um, 
but you'll see on the next slide that there are a few key distinctions that I'm going to go through to kind of explain um, the differences between the uh, the existing inventory and the and the combined port and the new portfolio. So here's a little graphic, um, and there's a lot of data here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through it a bit. Um, it's a little it's a little much to just to just absorb. Um, so the first column we have our total combined portfolio, which is everything we now have in Atlanta. Um, but really, I think as an investor, you're focusing on the difference between the middle column, the existing portfolio, and the new offerings that we have. Um, and I think one of the most stark things is the purchase price. Um, so you'll see the existing portfolio had a purchase price of around 367000 and the new offerings have a purchase price of around 250000 um, A few big reasons for the difference there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you'll see the bedroom count is lower, which means the new offerings are going to skew towards three bedrooms instead of four. Um, bath counts are lower, which makes sense. The square footage is much lower. Um, and the year built is a little bit older. And so when we think about the new offerings, um, I'm going to I'm going to go into a little bit of, of how we acquired these and, and the stark difference between those numbers. So. As part of Arrived, we do look at MLS listings and we look through, you know, your typical Zillow sourcing. We have a lot of ways that we pour homes into the top of our funnel to look at to find out what we want to buy. But we also have uh, B2B partnerships uh, where we develop relationships with other other companies, other groups, other individuals. And we look for opportunities there for our investors. And these properties uh, are part of a B2B deal that we did where we were able to pick up a group of homes that had been freshly rehabbed to very nice standards um, and were able to pick them up at a very good purchase price. Um, a little color around the purchase price as well. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Um, if, you, if you've been following real estate, you'll know that inventory is still extremely low. There are very few homes that are being listed for sale. Um, there's a lot of a lot of reasons for that, which I'm not going to go too far down that rabbit hole, but basically people locked in mortgages very low and there's not a lot of people who are who are able to move and sell. And so if a home comes on the market in this $250,000 price range and it has, you know, a new roof and it's got a new kitchen and the floors are redone and it looks really nice, those homes are actually currently very difficult for us to win. Um, there's a lot of bidding wars going on at the low end um, of, of the low price points. And honestly, it's it's difficult for us to compete with, on, with a, to buy those homes on the MLS um, to get you guys the best deals and the best yields and the best returns. So this really gives us an opportunity um, to partner or to, I don't want to say partner, to to work with another, another big company um, and source deals for you guys that are going to get you, source deals for you guys that are going to get you good returns. Um, and uh and at an attractive purchase price and homes that are that have been hardened and rehabbed up to really good standards um so even though the year built on some of these might be a little bit uh older than uh our our average product these have been renovated very well um and they should provide a really good investing experience over our uh, over our lifetime hold um of five to seven years estimated and um I guess I'll, I'll quickly also point out um, something else uh, in this. So you you know you see we have 20 homes and we're we're buying seven more. Um, we haven't had as many Atlanta in Q3 and four of last year. Atlanta slowed down a bit. Um, you know some of that is because homes in the you know 350k price range. A lot of those weren't delivering the yields that we wanted. Um, and so that's another reason why we've gone towards this price point. Um, another interesting thing is that there are some, uh, going back to what Cam said about Atlanta being one of the biggest centers for REIT ownership, there are some HOAs in the Atlanta area that have pushed back a bit on rentals. And we are, as we try to acquire homes, we have to do a lot of diligence and research to make sure that we are not buying into a hostile HOA that's going to create issues with rentals. Um, of the seven properties, I believe that we're dropping today, I believe five don't have an HOA and two have an HOA that we have vetted. Um, we have a diligence team that actually vets the HOAs 
Um, they're, our diligence team is great. They're always finding really in-depth stuff about properties and, and finding little places that, um, or excuse me, finding little things that could, you know, hurt our investor experience. And we can get ahead of that and prevent that and not buy those or remedy those before we purchase. Um, and so that's another thing that we've been really focusing on is trying to make sure that we're going through our diligence team, vetting the HOAs and, and vetting everything else and making sure that we put investments on the platform that you're not only going to be proud to own, but that you're also going to have a really good investor experience um, over the over the period you hold it. Um, and with that, I think I'm ready to throw it back for questions. Wonderful. Jeff and Cameron, thank you so much for your prepared remarks. Y'all got a sneak peek. Jake just dropped the line that we currently have all properties available on our website right now. So you can actually hop in there and start investing. Y'all are the first to hear actually uh, during the webinar. So let us know if there's any questions as you go through and peek at those. Uh, but y'all are getting a sneak peek and able to invest. I'm going to go ahead and remove this really quick and then we'll hop into all the Q&A that we're seeing here. One moment. Wonderful. Uh, the first one is from Serge. Can you provide some insights into why you are restricted in the amount that investor can invest in a particular property? So A, how do you determine the properties that you should uh, restrict to a certain limited amount? And B, I understand the restrictions so that everyone is able to invest in some property, but I find the hundred dollar limit and quite is quite small for some properties. So Cameron, I'll kick this one over to you. I can also add color in as well. Yeah, sure thing. It's um, it's a very mechanical answer. So hopefully this is a, as an easy one. So the hundred dollar minimum, it, certainly it seems uh, low compared to certain properties, uh, but that is also kind of the point of arrived is to provide an accessible entry point into a diversified portfolio of properties. So uh, I think that's very core to what we believe in and you could expect consistency across that. As far as the maximum amount, that is also, well, I guess that it comes in two flavors. The first is that there's a 9.8% limit on any one investment on arrived. Um, and that's for any property um, with the exception of some special ones that have a max of $500, or as, as some of you know, is um, to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to, to get started. Um, on arrive and have more equity available. So, uh, so those are the answers to kind of the, the mins and maxes um, mechanically. Wonderful. Awesome. Thanks so much for walking through it, Cameron. Serge, let us know if there's any color there. It's a pretty straightforward answer, but uh, happy to walk through it further. Trent just said, just finished buying shares of seven new properties. Think I might have set a new speed. Thanks, uh, it took them 75 seconds. That's absolutely fantastic. So it looks like Michael's sitting at, they got three done. Let us know your time, Michael, too. We always time ourselves internally as well. Uh, another question in here and comment from Serge, which is very top of mind for our product roadmap. I feel like you've been sitting in our meetings maybe. Um, when I browse the available properties and make up my mind on the ones that I want to invest in, I find it's hard to remember which ones I am interested in unless I make a note. Um, can you add a favorite so we can mark the ones we are interested in? Yeah, so I think from a product roadmap point of view, having more customizability for the the investor page and interacting, you know, with your profile is uh, very top of mind for us. There's some other exciting features that are going to make your account a lot more interactive and have a lot more features in it, um, hopefully coming up this year. Uh, so I'm not going to spoil the surprise on that, but definitely well noted on the feedback of um, Kind of remembering which ones you like and having the notes and it'll also become a much more of a necessary feature as we increase supply too so there's definitely a push internally for us to start acquiring more properties more vacation rentals expand our market so as we do have that bigger spread um, i agree that that kind of functionality would be critical wonderful uh yes more to come in that so right in line with our product roadmap we are building for and by each and every investor so if you have feedback on functionality within the platform and asset class market so on and so forth definitely let us know in the chat would love to hear from you all uh the next one i see in here is from olivier olivieria 
I'm so sorry if that's phonetically off, keep me honest. Um, I noticed yesterday the returns for these new ones were higher than they are today. Could you explain what happened? Cameron, I'll kick that over to you. And then Jeff, if you have any color as well. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, first I want to say that y'all are an amazing group of people for like the kind of vigilance. And it's it's awesome to see that level of engagement. So first I want to say like kudos to y'all for um, being so engaged. We appreciate that. Now, the story on this one specifically is that we use um, kind of a default data service provider that helps give us an estimate of the historical returns and then gives us an idea of, you know, forward looking returns. And that's all part of the kind of data and underwriting process. So once we have these in the coming soon status, we were kind of grooming through our inventory list. And then we noticed that some seemed abnormally high. So we looked into our data service provider and it just doesn't seem like they had kind of updated the, the data to be reflective of more of the current environment. So we looked at our alternative data provider um, and we ran their zip code numbers for the same properties. And it looked like a much more reasonable anticipation and more the, the low to mid single digits for appreciation, which given where rates are, we just thought it was a much more fair representation of reality. Uh, so, you know, both credible data service providers, names that you would all be familiar with, um, but, you know, we have to pick one or the other as part of our methodology, and we just didn't believe that the first one was fairly representative. Um, and we were just trying to be a little bit more, you know, conservative, too, in expectations because, you know, given the market, we would skew more towards um, being flat than being overly aggressive. So that's the adjustment on that side. Um, but again, both third-party credible data providers uh, driving the information. Wonderful. Thanks for walking through it and echoing Cameron. Appreciate the due diligence and all the work that y'all do prior to investing. It helps us understand what's important and obviously appreciate y'all posing the question. I, I did see another question in here about the Brennan TBD on when we will release that. We'll be sure to share a date on the property card so you are um, aware of when that will be launched. I saw another one in here from Michael. Jeff, I'm going to kick this one over to you. Are you looking at the Missouri market? Yes, um, we are. Uh, we are looking at the Missouri market for both long-term and short-term rentals. Um, there are several short-term rental markets in Missouri that we've been eyeing and several long-term. Um, and I would, as an investor, I would expect that you will see Missouri properties um, in the Arrive portfolio um, probably probably soon. So um, that, is, that is actively being looked at. Wonderful. And then I just saw Martin pop in here. Any properties in the future that we'll see in California, Oregon, Washington, West Coast, Best Coast, maybe? <laughs> um, so I think we do we do look at a lot of different locations. There are some locations that are more of a challenge than others, and for different reasons. Um, you know, I, two of two of those you just listed, California and Oregon. Those are those are some of the most challenging from a you know regulatory and um, some other. There there are a few other issues that make it more difficult to get rentals in those markets. That's not to say we won't be in those markets. But there is a bit of a higher hurdle for certain locations for us to get you the returns, the risk profile and everything that we think um, we think you really need as an investor. Um, but we, we certainly don't just cross something off and say we're never going to buy here. Uh, we do we do look at a lot of markets and watch for things that change, watch for pricing or returns that change, watch for regulations that change. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll grab stuff that we think is a, a good a good idea. And I think and I also think that it's an opportunity to discuss asset classes because the model of long-term rentals can be applied to single family okay. residential, so standalone homes, or can it be applied to multifamily of different varieties, two to four unit, eight plus unit, all the way up to your, you know, massive grade A apartments. So, or class A, excuse me. So, you know, we just need to find the right entry point. And the model we've largely focused on is single family residential, which is why we skewed more towards the Southeast part of the the country, the Sun Belt, as it's commonly referred to. Um, so, you know, not to say that the coastal cities aren't coming, but it's just the right entry point is needed to justify making a good move on it. So I, I, that's to me the more uh, like realistic entry point for us, as opposed to deciding to buy single family residential in Palo Alto. You know, it's, I, I don't know that, I think we kind of missed the boat once Silicon Valley took off. <laughs> you know, um, paying $2,000 per square foot is not great for 
the, the long-term rental model. So um, again, just need to match the investment model with the geography, with the asset class, which is um, kind of the formula for what we, uh, of what we look at when we're, you know, considering what to invest in. Wonderful. And there's, there's a one following this, uh, Jeff, that I'm going to kick over to you and then Cameron, if you have color, when looking at properties, do you also look at crime rates? I think it would also be good to add in a few other things that you look at, Jeff, in terms of due diligence as well. Sure. Um, so crime rates, crime rates is an interesting one. Um, I, I would say we probably do, but maybe not in the more maybe not in the more explicit way that you would think right so um typically a lot of the associated stats with homes uh school ratings crime rates economic activity a lot of things are pretty heavily correlated you know so you're probably not going to be buying you know a, a million dollar house in an extremely high crime rate neighborhood um in most places in the country um so you know i don't think crime rate is one of our you know top driving factors um I think maybe if we were buying $60,000 homes or something on the very low end, we would probably be focusing more on that in terms of finding the safest areas to buy a very, very low priced home. Um, so I, I really think in our, in our lane, in our kind of single family lane right now, we're not focusing a ton on crime rates, but that is something that uh, we look at um, when we look at schools, when we look at population growth and job growth and things like that those are all pretty heavily correlated to crime rate. And I, and I think expectations have to be calibrated to the type of investment that's being purchased. So the more that you go up the price point and then into deeper suburban neighborhoods, you're not gonna really find much crime. But then if you're participating at lower price points where they're closer to more like you know, commercial zones, right? A lot of times crime is not necessarily residential in nature. A lot of times it's proximity to a commercial zone where there's property crime and small theft and more misdemeanor style crime. So I, I would say that a lot of the crime evaluation happens at a macro sense. So the the places that we choose to invest in, in the sense of like, you know, inner city or sub suburban, and then, and then which markets and then which price points, those determine which grade of crime risk you would fall into. So to the extent that you're more in inner city and like call, we'll call it subsidized developments, you might have more violent crime exposure where more of that stuff happens. But if you're in an area close to commercial and it's property crime, but that's where residential is situated and it's high value real estate, it's something that you, that, you know, in light of that, it's reasonable and it doesn't scare you away from the investment decision. So th that's how we ev evaluate crime, but on a detail by detail sense, you know, looking tactically at one specific properties, you know, crime risk is not as instructive as determining at the macro level, what do you choose to participate in? And you generally avoid violent crime areas because that's a real tough proposition to try to get appreciation in, but property crime is often kind of adjacent to development. Yeah, and Definitely. Oh. Yeah, sorry, really, really quick to because I saw I saw Michael follow up in the chat about uh, one of the Albuquerque properties showing um, a home where which has bars on the windows next door. A um, couple points on that. Um, I think the Southwest uh, you tend to you tend to find. In my experience, living in Vegas, uh, moving out here from the East Coast, I think that's that's you tend to find that more out here in general, but also specifically on the area we're buying in Albuquerque. I will say that we are that area historically has not been amazing um you know but there we are buying right next to a couple new developments and over time you as an investor are going to see the appreciation and the change in that area right so even if an area has historically had crime and you're looking at a house built in 1997 that has bars on the windows if you see people building you know brand new dr horton communities or something like that right next to it and you see the schools during during the seven years you own the property you see the schools go from a two or a three up to a five or a six that's how you really make you know that's how you can potentially make outsized returns is getting into a neighborhood as it's on the way up um and as as they start building new stuff and new new shops come there new infrastructure things like that 
Awesome. You caught me to it. That's the question I was going to follow up on. So I think we have 10 Michaels in here today, but Michael, uh, let us know if there's any color needed there. I also so appreciate the due diligence and like actually looking through all our photos. So keep it coming. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. I did see one in here from Carnell. The ride looked into multi-family homes. Cameron, I'm going to kick that one over to you. Yeah, I'd say that the majority of our focus has been on single family residential. You know, it's the residential real estate largest asset class in the country. So there's plenty of, um, you know, areas of opportunity for single family residential. Well, with that said, when we're contemplating market expansion, that's where multifamily starts getting more interesting. And I'll, I'll also say that the very accelerated rate of interest rate increases has also you know, accelerated our interest in multifamily because you're trying to match the cash flows and the returns to, well, risk-free rates, right? So I think that we're definitely starting to look more into it for both purposes of market expansion and just economic thesis. It's also why uh, the seven Atlanta properties that you saw compared to our 20 have gone down in price points because we're driving more towards yield um, and a safe haven, right? So if you operate with newer assets or effectively newer assets with new roofs and new kitchens and you're at a low price point that's pretty good protection like i i would feel i personally you know have some more you know investments that are skewed heavily towards that so you know that's the thesis that we're you know enacting here at arrive is to just be defensive right now um so so at any rate multifamily is definitely part of that equation we don't know how long the sustained you know, interest rates will be sustained for how long? So um, it's definitely very top of mind to, to search out those opportunities. Wonderful. Always a great question. If there's any other asset classes, definitely let me let us know. I know Michael had left a comment, single family is the best investment. Uh, definitely appreciate the feedback in there. I saw one from Sanjay. I noticed a lot of new companies are doing what you're doing. How do you, how do you all view competition in the real estate market and what what other market will y'all enter in the future? Cameron, I'll kick that over to you. I know there's like multi, there's a lot of different directions there. I um, mean, obviously we know there's a myriad of different ways to diversify your wealth, whether it's traditional or a newer way. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's, there's so many different business models that it would be hard to characterize, you know, us versus all of them, but I'll tell you what we've concentrated on. And, you know, it's a couple things. So really good investments. I think that we've, our selection rate is extremely picky and we've kind of seen it through some of the supply droughts that we've had on, on the site, a volatile interest rate market, volatile real estate market. So we've tried to um, be very disciplined in our purchasing. Another thing is that we make a very intentional investment in our relationship with the SEC to be a transparent organization. And that is no easy task. We have a full-time legal team that is more on the offensive than the defensive. And it's very expensive and difficult to try to do this business model. I mean, you know, regulation is necessary, but it's also tough. Um, so we're very strategic about investing in that. And the other, the kind of the last pillar of what I would say that we do is we're, we're very focused on the individual experience, both with the home and the investor. So I'm sure each one of you have probably interacted with Corinne before, you know, whether you knew it or not, but behind the scenes, when you reach out to support, that's Corinne, every, Corinne's behind every single one of those. And, you know, that type of individualized feedback where somebody who really knows all about the operations and everything we're doing at the company, answering all of your questions, that's part of the experience, as well as being able to bring every single, the details of every single investment onto the platform. So you could even see something like bars on a window. Most of the opportunities that you see in the market right now are these larger aggregated funds, where even if you can invest as a non-accredited investor, you don't really know what you're investing in because it's kind of veiled behind a larger portfolio. So with Arrive, that individual experience of both the, the, the property as well as your interaction with the team, I would say is what we've really focused on. So that regulatory and just the investment discipline is kind of our trifecta of what um, we've in, been very intentional about investing in. Definitely. Cameron, thank you so much for the kind words always. I'm beyond grateful to walk alongside each of 
you and Jeff every day, as well as a whole host of investors that we've been able to grow with over the last few years. So definitely appreciate it. Um, I saw Michael and Lisa with kind words in the chat too. Definitely appreciate it. Hawaii market. What are your thoughts, Jeff? We'll kick this one to you first. I'm sure Cameron has some feelings as well. Yeah, um, I think Hawaii is definitely an interesting market. Um, it, it is one of the markets that does have some challenges um, in terms of just you know price point. It's very expensive there. Um, you know, having the infrastructure to manage properties there. So there's there's a couple things kind of in the way. Um, I think as of right now, we're probably evaluating it more heavily on an STR. Uh, on vacation rentals side than a long-term rental side, but it is certainly a market that we look at and, and evaluate opportunities in. Wonderful. Um, if, I'm curious to Michael, if there's a particular city within Hawaii or Island, I uh, would love to hear your thoughts just because obviously Jeff, as you know, it varies uh, per market for Hawaii as a whole. So would love to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, Keith has a great question in here. There's a lot of product related uh, questions which we always appreciate. Any updates on moving to monthly payments? Uh, for those of you on the line, we currently distribute dividends on a quarterly basis. So for example, Q4 dividends were paid out in early January 2023, and they go directly back to your connected bank account on arrived. We are looking to do monthly to essentially mirror what you would see as a traditional uh, real estate you know, property owner. So more to come, we're aiming for the next few months. As, a, as we said about the mobile app, that can always shift, uh, but we're aiming for the next few months, Keith, and definitely appreciate the question. One in here from Brandon on returns. How much money could I really make with a $500 investment? Cameron, I'll kick that to you. Yeah, the good good question. And let, let's just say a, a $1,000 just to make the, the math a little bit easier, just because I don't know if I'm up for working with five as much as 10 right now, but let, let's, let's say that, um, we can give guidance on some rules of thumb, um, especially with long-term rentals. So we looked at some data, uh, from our data providers and said, okay, from 2000 to 2020, what was the compound annual growth rate? Which means each year, how much did property appreciate on average over those 20 years? And it's about 4%, 3.97 to be exact from our calculation, but let's call it four. And then when we look at the dividend rates, um, on our, the arrived properties, they can range from five, six, three, four, depends on a lot of things, market leverage strategy, but let's just call it four, you know, to make the math a little bit easier. So about half of your returns, we expect to come from appreciation. Half of your returns, we would expect to come from dividend income. So the rental income that you're getting um, every quarter and soon to be every month. So, you know, if you think about a thousand dollars, then and you're getting forty dollars worth for every thousand dollars. You're getting forty dollars of rental income per year, and then forty dollars of appreciation, which will manifest itself through the increase in the share price, as that's one of the main drivers of that share price um, that you purchase. Right, at ten dollars per share for every share that you buy. That's kind of the starting price, and then as the cash changes, and then as the property value changes, those are just the input factors to how does your share value change, which is the appreciation on the investment. So that's, you know, some rule of thumb, thousand bucks, half, half, 4%, 4% dividends appreciation. And that, that could be a fairly um, good rule of thumb on a large enough, um, you know, diversified portfolio. And just on a point of diversification, I say that because on any one property, you might experience a fair amount of volatility. Maybe there's an eviction and you're not able to cash flow. Maybe a property really appreciated way more than we expected, and it far exceeds the appreciation expectation. So the, the range of outcomes on any one property on both cash flow and appreciation can be fairly large. But once you start getting to three properties, five properties, and then 10, a lot of that smoothens out. And it doesn't take that many to start really getting the benefits of that diversification. And we operate in over 35 markets at this point. So there's a lot of options to choose from, from STRs, LTRs, different parts of the country um, that we've curated different investments. But just wanted to go on that little side tangent as we were talking about returns, because there there's going to be a difference in reality on one investment than what I had just said as far as a rule of thumb, right? I'm talking about the entire United States of America from 2000 to 2020 is 4%. So we're using that as an average over a huge number of um, data points. So uh, a little bit of caveat emptor, word of caution there, but you know, it's a fairly 
um, I don't want to say accurate, but like not unreasonable rule of thumb on a large enough basis. Awesome. Thanks for walking through it, Cameron. I'm going to kick this next one over to Jeff. This is from Brooklyn. As a realtor, if we can bring a tenant to a property or a PM, is commission offered? Hence why I asked about marketing materials early up in the chat. So definitely appreciate it, Brooklyn. I might I might throw that to Cam. I, th I think they're talking about the I think they're talking about the MLS commission for like sourcing a tenant. Mm. So, uh, so we utilize third party property managers for that leasing operations. So to the extent that they would have an MLS listing offering commission, then that would be certainly available to you. Um, to the extent that it's not and they're just sourcing internally, um, then it wouldn't, but we don't control the, the listing of the properties ourselves. So, um, it's not a policy that, you know, we could maybe influence as far as saying like, hey, we want our properties on the MLS or we don't want them on the MLS. But uh, either way, it would be the property manager that you would directly uh, be taking the commission from, you know, through their license and et cetera. Wonderful. And I just dropped a link, Brooklyn, um, on collaborating. So we have a few different ways to kind of describe yourself, whether it be agent broker, property manager, flipper, turnkey operator, wholesaler. So if you're interested in collaborating, would absolutely love to hear from you and appreciate uh, your interest in Arrived as a whole and obviously your background as well. I did see another mention in here about, I, from Edwin, I noticed uh, transaction time are consistently longer than stated. This some, sometimes works to my advantage when transferring funds within, this, within accounts. Has this happened to others? I will say we typically stand like hover in between three to five business days. If you do go longer than that, feel free to ping support at arrive.com. I can take a look or our team can specifically at those transactions. Absolutely more than happy to. As I understand, if you have funds moving, uh, it's important to know where they are, where they're at. So uh, keep us honest in the chat. If there's any other questions there, happy to take a look. Uh, one in here from Remington. Thrilled to see you here today. I know we've chatted quite a bit. Uh, given the historically hot real estate market the past 10 years, I sometimes find myself thinking that a zip code with high past appreciation is almost similar to buying a stock, stock high and vice versa as similar to buying a stock low. Do you generally think that historical appreciation will continue at the same rate it has in the past? Or should we perhaps see a one to 2% past historical appreciation as a buying opportunity? Oh my gosh, words are hard. Such a good, but this is such a good question because we, we think about this all the time. Yes. I mean, we, and we say this all the time, right? So where did we not buy heavily, you know, since we've started, a lot of it was the West coast. We, you know, I know we've been buying long-term rentals and, or sorry, short-term rentals in Phoenix. And there's, there's definitely a good argument to be made that vacation rentals are great in Phoenix. It's the better, it's the better utilization play for residential real estate there, but the long-term rental market, I mean, you know, it's tough because the run-up was so high. So if you do look at historical appreciation, it looks like it smashes, but then to your point, you're right. You know, the, those who rise the fastest and the highest fall, the fall, the fastest as well. So it's also why we've moved our strategy to the $250,000 price point as well. Right. So it's just a shifting. Um, now to your question, it's hard to say, right? Because it's not a slam dunk that those with lower appreciation are going to have more upside because I could point you to Gary, Indiana. Now that isn't like, I, yeah, I'm sure it expresses a lot of negative historical appreciation, but it doesn't mean that it's the opportunity. So we have to find the diamond in the rough. So an example of that, maybe, I don't know, Huntsville may be a somewhat of an example. Okay. So it, I don't think it has insane price appreciation and it's not, you know, it's definitely had its moment in the spotlight, right? Um, it's a technology economy. It's a data economy driven there. Um, but you know, we like the fundamentals. So I think that's what it comes down to. You always have to look back to the fundamentals and as like one point of nuance is like this, cause I really like this question because this is like the guts and core of what we talk about. Uh, like internally to try to figure out where, because we're trying to forecast our vision seven years ahead of time, saying like where in seven years, where, you know, would we have wanted to invest that would not be intuitive today? So all the hot names, you know, proceed with caution. Now, some of it is justified because they really do have such strong fundamentals that 
you're missing the boat if you don't get in, even if you don't like the entry price. Because if you're forecasting that it's going to go up, go ahead, get on that train, even if the appreciation was high already. But let's say that there's a place where it's just like kind of coming into its groove. So the term that we use internally is like, can a city reach critical mass and escape velocity for becoming a bigger city? So will people move there? Is there any reason why somebody should move there? So you probably have to have an interstate freeway system that somehow connects it. You got to be close enough to an airport or there has to be some sort of like quality of life thing that people would flock there. So there's probably locations in Colorado that are not like immediately, oh yeah, people are rushing to move there, but it may be the good long-term bet because you have an interstate freeway system there. Denver International Airport's not too far away from some of those, like that I-30 corridor in those places. So like some of those places that haven't like historically done as well, maybe the diamonds in the rough, like a Fort Collins. Mm. So there's no right answer here, right? Cause like you, you, you can't just look at the number and, you know, make some prediction about momentum, right? Cause you may be wrong if you, if the fundamentals of it aren't right. So, you know, we started off talking about Atlanta with population growth and, you know, from a home price appreciation point of view, population's everything, right? You need physical bodies to occupy a house. So if you don't have people, it's like, what are you even you know doing there? Uh, the other part is housing supply, um, which we haven't touched quite as much on, but that data is a little, you know, we can cover that data uh, fuller later. But at, at any rate, I love the question. I, I don't have a great conclusion for you because I've been just kind of rambling about it here. But that 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 is the key is that it, there's no clear answer. It's kind of the art of picking investments. So, you know, we look at a lot of that kind of stuff to figure out where we should go. Wonderful. Thanks so much uh, for asking the question. Remington, absolutely fantastic. You saw a little bit of hard eyes, I think, show up in Cameron's eyes when, when that question came through, just because we do talk about it so much internally. So uh, definitely appreciate it. I, I also want to mention, since we released these properties live today on the, on the webinar, we've already fully funded two out of the nine that have been released. So that's roughly... 1.4 million in transactions. So I'm glad you all were able to jump in quickly and invest uh, so fast with all of us on the line. So uh, there was one in here from Michael. Does Arrive get fully reimbursed for the capital it fronted on once the property fully funds? I saw that the term is up to 18 months. Just wondering in regards to interest cost. Yeah, definitely. That, that That's a great question. So yes, we do get reimbursed for the capital up front and there is a fixed financing cost attached to it um, that is disclosed in the use of proceeds no additional you know interest or you know fees associated with that though so every um dollar that either it goes towards the capitalization of the investment like for the actual home or for services paid to arrived those are all clearly itemized in the what we call the use of proceeds table on every investment page and that also gets filed with the SEC. So you'll go, you'll, like, you'll see the link, click on it. It'll take you to the sec.gov website where you can see the filing. Wonderful. Thanks for walking through it, Cameron. Um, ooh, this, this is going to be a combo question. We'll kick it over to Jeff first. And then, Cameron, I know you've answered this one previously. How many additional properties do you anticipate for launching in 2023 uh, or 2024? This is from Alex. Um, hopefully, hopefully a lot, uh, hopefully, uh, and I, and I know that's, that's a little bit ambiguous and maybe Kim is going to provide a little bit more of an exact target. Um, but, uh, you know, people, investors really like the product and, uh, we're seeing really good response to the homes that we're fi finding and the investments we're offering. Um, so I hope, I hope it's quite a bit more than, than last year. And I hope next year is quite a bit more than this year, but uh, I'll let Cam speak to maybe some more magnitude. Yeah, so uh, I would say that a good target for us probably for the rest of the year in terms of property purchase volume would be around $100 million. Um, so, you know, we're looking at, say, nine months of buying activity, uh, a little bit more than 10 million per month. Hopefully we can far exceed that. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a March, you know, the, the cadence that we're trying to establish, uh, managing our capital, our cash reserves, and um, just the flow. Um, but yeah, I would say that it the number of homes, it's really going to depend on the investment mix of how many short-term rentals versus how many long-term rentals. So our average purchase price right now on long-term rentals is somewhere between 250 to 300, depends on the market. 
um, but definitely a lower price point than we were at a year ago, being more so in the 320 to 360 range for our average homes. Um, but you know, you would say, well, about four long-term rentals per million dollars. And every short-term rental is going to be close to a million dollars because you also have a lot more um, initial investment into the furnishing and the experience that you're looking to create to generate the income. So call it a hundred million dollars of total property volume. And for every million dollars of property volume, that would be four long-term rentals or one short-term rental. And that's kind of the sizing of the math. Wonderful. Um, Michael, I saw that you're a broker in Atlanta, thrilled to hear. For that link that we drop, our team, just so y'all are aware, reviews them on a weekly cadence. So you will definitely hear back from us. Uh, we do look at each and every one that comes through and so appreciate the interest in Arrived as a whole. Uh, one in here from Janet Lee, please, can you explain the equity decrease on the Heinz? Let's see. Pull um, it up, Janet Lee, one second. Cool. Yeah, let's see. We may want to take this one separately as I don't have those right in front of me. And we have, um, you know, over 200 properties at this point. So I'm not immediately versed on giving an informed answer. So let's take that one off. Yeah, on. definitely. Janet Lee, if you want to shoot us an email, support at arrive.com. More than happy to take a look. Uh, we're focused, obviously, on working through all the questions today and want to make sure your voice is heard. So definitely feel free to, to push that our way. I saw uh, Brooklyn ask another question here. Are you planning on choosing any STR properties in the near future? And if so, what markets are you tar targeting? Um, another question from Brooklyn, but we'll hold that one. Yep. Yeah. So market expansion is always part of what we do. And one of the challenges with STRs is finding the best managers that align with our investment thesis of really being able to create an experience. So a lot of the management companies that we vet and interview, they're kind of run of the mill property managers. So there's not quite as many that can align on the revenue and design experience that we're looking for. With that said, uh, I, and I only say that to kind of paint a picture of the diligence that we do before we enter into a market. So even if it seems like there may be a good opportunity in a market, we don't always have the management available to us because we're operating short-term rentals as um, non-owner occupied investments. And that is one of the trickiest things in dealing with STRs is because if you're an owner occupant, meaning that you live in the house and you rent out a room, you could probably do that most anywhere. And, and you know, asterisk, asterisk, but it's flexible. If you don't live there though, that's where all the regulations come in that prevent you from doing it. So there's only select cities, select municipalities and select street corners that you can do this. Okay. So definitely uh, short-term rentals is a core investment for us. You know, we're, we're betting on it from a utilization plate. We think that it's a very good utilization of residential assets to monetize as an investment. Um, there's, a, there's a niche in particular that we think needs to be filled, which is larger group accommodations. So you go to any sort of hotel, it's not quite the same as being you know, in a house with 10 of your friends, right? For a particular weekend experience. And a hotel may not be able to offer some of the theme stuff that we're doing, such as a huge fire pit or a, some kind of sports court with bocce ball and basketball and all sorts of things. Um, so there's a lot of markets where we can execute short-term rentals, like there's demand there, but we have to meet the permitting regulations as well as the management hurdle who's aligned with our investment thesis. So. It's on the roadmap. We are already in nearly 15 short-term rental markets. Um, so given that our first investments uh, were offered six months ago, it has been a pretty wild and rapid expansion for us. Um, but we also wanna make sure that the management footprint is reasonably contained. So that way we can deliver you know, on the uh, investments that have been offered already, right? We don't wanna get past our skis and kind of misallocate capital. Uh, so we're careful about it. It's operationally intensive. So we, we try to make sure that every move we're making is reasonably calculated and, and good. Uh, but yeah, just painting the picture here for wanting to expand, but meeting the hurdles first is, is necessary before we go further. 
Wonderful. I'm going to rapid fire two questions really quick. Uh, any news on the redemption program from the review with the SEC? So quick note on how we function as a whole in our whole thesis. So for our single family residential or long term, the whole period is five to seven years. For vacation rentals, it's five to 15 years. As you've likely heard Cameron and Jeff talk about it, those are essentially flexible. It's going to be um, dependent on a myriad of different details. In short, all investments right now are intended to be held for those full investment periods that we have in place. So we have not heard back yet from the SEC on qualifying the redemption program, but as soon as that is live, we will be sure to share with you and definitely appreciate the question, AB. And then Martin, I saw another one in here. How do you differ from, com from competitors? I know you mentioned here, Fintor, ARC7, Cameron, I believe you walked through all of our different differ, differentiators earlier, but Martin, let us know if there's any color that you would like there. I'm happy to, to jump back in. Um, I do see the questions still flying through, so no, we have them queued up behind the scenes. Uh, Jeff, I'm gonna kick this next one to you from Brandon. Do you have one property management company for, the, for all Atlanta properties? Um, <clears throat> I... I believe we have one that we use for most of our Atlanta properties. Um, I can't confirm that we only have one, um, but I know that we are concentrated with one for sure. Yeah, we have um, redundancy. So uh, the, the property manager that we use for these upcoming seven is going to be Mind Property Management, M-Y-N-D. So they're one of the regional partners that we use, very reputable, um, has the best technology platform that I've seen for um, any larger property management company. So excited to work with them. And they have a large physical presence there too, uh, which is important for trying to onboard a larger MSA. Because Atlanta, you know, as I said, it's the eighth or ninth largest MSA. So, and it's a heavy rental market to begin with. So proportionally, we would expect um, a portfolio on a ride that is growing in conjunction with the opportunity there. So uh, that's why we also need a couple property managers there for redundancy. So we, uh, we actually do have a couple of properties that um, are in Atlanta that predated mine. So we, we do have a couple um, other managers out there, but the majority of large management companies will operate in Atlanta and have a physical presence there. Uh, quick question uh, that I see there, what's MSA? It stands for Metropolitan Statistical Area. So it's the grouping of cities, townships, the thing that we would usually say, oh, that's Atlanta. Well, Atlanta is actually only 500,000 people and it's like this big. The MSA is 6 million people and like this big. So it just, there's not so much a rhyme and reason. It's kind of a Census Bureau thing at the federal level of how they carve up, but they, they decompose it into zip codes. So like the, the zip codes of MSAs like can be mapped to each other and that's what we call them. And then one level above an MSA is called the CSA. It's called the Combined Statistical Area, which is just like a combination of MSAs that are like logically grouped together for us tracking purposes of like growth and movement of people and economics like all of that is like categorized into zip codes in that way so a little bit behind msa csa but that does drive the data we consume of macro stuff that you know we've been talking about of like hey where are people moving and you know that's that's the kind of stuff we use wonderful uh quick time check i know we have like two minutes how are cameron and jeff how y'all doing on time uh, I'm good to go. Usually I have a one-on-one -on -one, um, at this time with our CEO, but he's currently on paternity leave as his uh, son was just born. Yeah, I'm good. A new, a new arrival. Okay. We'll keep, we'll keep, uh, and we'll keep going here because we have a myriad of questions. I'm going to try and rapid fire. I know Michael had asked thoughts on arrived investment seminar meeting for existing arrived owners on site, arrived offices or at a hotel, have some properties go live at the meeting. Absolutely love the feedback. We have done two investor only happy hours. So one was in Nashville for the release of the 100. And then we also did one on our offsite this last January um, in Arizona at one of our vacation rentals. So Michael, definitely love the feedback. We are hoping to do this in the future and absolutely love the idea. So we'll be sure to sh circulate that with our team um, post webinar. I saw one in here from Harmit. My question, if the property value in my portfolio goes down, will that reduce my income greatly? I'm not sure as I am not sure as the rent stays steady. Yeah, good question. So the income is a function of the rent amount that is signed. 
Uh, so even if a property valuation were to go down, that should not have any impact on that current income stream. Now, to the extent that the market changes, that could impact the rental market. So as we get new tenants, there may be a different leasing dynamic. But for that specific investment, there's not a tethering of the share value to the amount of income that you get. Right? So they're, they're wholly independent from each other. Awesome. Brett's, Brett's being our uh, director of content is in the chat making me laugh. So appreciate you being here, Brett. Uh, one from Serge. This is a fantastic question, obviously very relevant. Was Arrive impacted by SVB's failure in another, in another world? Did Arrive hold any deposits or borrow money for investments from the bank? I'll kick that one over to you, Cameron and uh, Jeff, if you have any color, but I did address briefly in the chat. It's always good to walk through live too. Yeah, so we don't have any banking relationship or any, um, you know, direct funds or deposits held with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, so no, we we weren't directly impacted by that. Awesome. And then I know Edwin had asked, are you holding um, are you holding beyond seven years if conditions are not good for sale? You usually have a slogan for this one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. This the slogan that I have is never sell for a loss, right? Because um, as cash flowing investments, we have staying power. So, you know, what that means is we can ride the markets out. They're going to continue to be operated as rentals or whatever cash flowing uh, operating model that we have, including vacation rentals, right? Because the same could be said for vacation rentals that the market's down and hey, we have staying power though. We're still generating income. Um, a lot of people ran into trouble during the great recession because they had mortgages that they could not support with their income. So they, you know, they lost them. Um, and the opposite is true with ours in the sense that they're very conservatively underwritten. So they have what are called high coverage ratios where basically have the cash to keep the investment going because we have um, moderate and conservative debt. If there is even any debt, most of our properties um, that have been released in the last couple months have been debt free because it just hasn't been the right investment strategy at this time. Um, to take on debt. So it really just depends on uh, a lot of those things, but uh, yeah. Wonderful, yeah, great questions. I see, and I'm definitely not ignoring them. They're just later down in here, but any thoughts on going public? Uh, Cameron, Jeff would love your thoughts. Uh, you know, so we're a series A company right now. We've gone through two rounds of funding. Typically a company that's ready to go public will go through Series C, Series D, maybe an E or an F, and then decide to go public. So there's you know three or four more rounds of material growth that the evolution of growth companies typically will go through before they're ready to go public. Now, I wouldn't say that explicitly our goal is like, hey, we need to go public. Certainly, it's a nice indicator that if the market believes you could, that it says something about the maturity and size and scale of your business model. So certainly, it would be a good position to be in to be even be considered um, in the conversation. But you know, there's so much to do in front of us that it's just not an explicit goal that we set for ourselves. Definitely a little bit more of alphabet that we want to go through. And also we want to be sure that we're meeting folks where we're at, where, we're, where the, you all are at um, and continuing to build and iterate. A couple quick notes too, I would say, um, we have folks on our team that are from Amazon, Microsoft, Smartsheet, Evernote, Uber, uh, Cameron and Jeff directly from American Homes for Rent. So we have folks that are from traditional real estate and then also tech, which is where Arrive essentially was born. And then we've had, uh, you know, we're backed by world-class investors such as Forerunner, Bezos Expeditions, which, which is the personal investment company of Jeff Bezos, Time Ventures, which is the investment fund of Mark uh, Benioff, Spencer Razkoff, former CEO of Zillow, Dara Kay, CEO of Uber. So just to name a few, a little bit of background and history for those that are newer to Arrived. Um, we'll keep cruising here, though. I know we have quite a few more questions. One in here from Tiffany. Jeff, I'm going to kick this one over to you. Is there any information that can be provided about the urban core property offerings that Jake mentioned during the fiscal breakdown back in January? Yeah. So um, we are still kind of looking at from, from my point of view, we're still looking for the right properties um, to offer investors in that in that product line. We we're looking in several different areas, and we're really trying to find the right match of returns, um, property condition, you know, uh, everything that's really going to be 
a good investment for our for our investors. And and I think that as we as we evaluated these and as we went through the different markets, we ran into a couple of challenges with you know um, finding again finding really the right the right property. We don't we don't want to launch with something um, that we think has too much risk. So we're really again still still evaluating lots of opportunities on that and trying to find the right stuff to, to put on the website. Yeah. And, and like the, the property specifically that we were looking at as we were creating this urban core product class, they, un, they seem to be good. The underwriting numbers looked good, but the reality of the property condition was not what we expected once we actually got access to the property. So yeah, it's one of the challenges of working in this, you know, in the space is that we have a certain standard and product quality. Uh, it's just harder to find in this class. So I think that the thesis still makes sense, right? As you go towards lower price points, yields can improve and there's a measure of kind of stability and defensiveness. I think that the outlet though, for that strategy for us, that's working are these homes that are at $250,000 price points with no shared walls, their own lot in a suburban neighborhood, newer construction. So these all seem to be in the same spirit of that defensive play, but in a safer asset play that's closer to the $350,000 asset, but just maybe economically more advantageous at this point in history. Wonderful. Yeah, definitely a great question. More to come, Tiffany. Um, as we mentioned, a few details about our product roadmap or a roadmap for arrived. If y'all are interested in a roadmap webinar, we've done one previously. Would love to see a thumbs up in the chat. We saw quite a few folks on the line. Uh, Tiffany, thanks for the kind words. We have one in here from Leslie. Is there a limit to the number of houses you would want in a specific city or area? Or are you looking to um, amass a minimum number of properties and cities you identify as investable? Uh, Jeff would love your thoughts. And then Kim, if you have any color and love all the thumbs up in there, maybe we'll do a product roadmap in the future. Um, so because uh, we have some, we have some property managers who are able to, we have a, a network of them who are able to handle properties in a lot of places. <clears throat> we don't have to have an extremely critical mass of properties before we enter um, a new market. So I'd say, is there a limit to how many? I think right now that would only be, and I can just tell you how I, I think on the investment team is I, I don't wanna put all of our investors into one or two areas in a short period of time, right? So if, if we're looking to buy things, I don't wanna put all, you know, one state on the website within a couple months, and then everyone gets has too much of that in their, in their portfolios. Um, but no, I, I don't think there's, I don't, I don't think in a, in a specific limit kind of way, I think more in a diversification um, kind of way when I'm thinking about that. And again, the, one of the benefits of arrived is we don't necessarily have to have that critical mass before we offer you a, a very geographically diverse portfolio, which I actually think is, is one of our best strengths. Awesome. I am sifting back up through here because I lost my question thread. So give me one moment. Thank you for walking through that, Jeff. Um, one in here, I'm new with the platform, but have one simple question. If I invest 100K, what is roughly the time frame I will get my 100K back? After you sell the home, do I get anything from that amount? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, I think the, the first place to start is to and start at the product level of what do you own, right? What are shares? And what shares are not is a is a a buy-in where you have to recoup that amount. You know, so if you buy a hundred k worth of property investments, that hundred k is tethered to shares at ten dollars per share at the time of buy-in, right? So at that point, you own ten thousand shares of different investments, and that's yours. You know, that's that doesn't decrease in value unless the third party value price appreciation goes down or operations, um, you know, you have more expenses than you do rental income, right? That's how that could go down. Um, but otherwise, you know, if you spend that 100K, it's not like you have to build up another 100K worth of value before you're back at even, you know, your 100K buy-in is you are at even. And then from the future, you'll earn rental income, you'll earn 
um, appreciation or stagnation if properties aren't appreciating, you know, that component of it may not be there, but those shares are secured by the real estate itself. Cause what you own is a share of a company that owns the property. So if you own 5% of a particular home, then, you know, that let's call it $50,000, you know, that $50,000, that 5% of that home, you know, is yours and earning the proportional income. So as that property generates income, then you get 5% of the total distribution after all fees and expenses. And then similarly, when you sell, you're going to get all of the appreciation and all of like the difference between that sale price net of expenses, you know, and then we're going to calculate a share price and, and say, okay, so Siddharth, you bought in at ten dollars uh five years ago we sold the property now each share is worth fourteen dollars so here's the same number of shares now worth fourteen dollars and like you get that same amount back um, so that's how it work it's not a fee to you know get a buy-in it's buying the equity so you're buying an ownership interest um, in the property wonderful I'm seeing a few like questions in here, so I'm going to try and pair them together just for time's sake. So Leslie had asked, do you consider investor interest in a city to determine if you look for additional properties? Uh, for example, Tuscaloosa, Alabama was available for a couple days, but all the other houses sold out quickly in that batch. I'm going to pause there. There's others on like uh, asset class, so I'll pause there. Yeah, definitely. I think that there is investor fatigue. Uh, you know, out there as far as once we do have a smattering of properties available in a particular market, then, you know, people have effectively gotten that exposure for that point in time. Um, so any incremental amounts of investment exposure um, to that market, you know, we would consider more of once we have more new investors who don't have exposure. Uh, so yes, we do balance where we have recently bought with where we should be buying next. Um, I think that we're still a small company with a small investor base. Um, but as that number grows, I think there's going to be stability in the offering, right? It'll start looking more like a portfolio of what's, you know, constantly being offered instead of these rounds of, you know, property drops where, you know, a couple of times a week we would drop one market or, you know, these five properties. So it's like, they would always be available, right? That is more the end state we're looking for of, of, uh, a shopping experience instead of, you know, trying to get concert tickets, right? That's not the experience we're trying to create, but um, naturally there's some constraints in just kind of growing the business model and getting it to more mature. We'd like to be, you know, the Costco more so like you always have investments available, like good rates and things that you can trust with good, you know, customer service um, and not ticket master where we're trying to scalp, you know, so. Wonderful. And I just saw a question from Tiffany on how is the timing of the go live property determined? It's a great question. I will say we typically hover around between 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. PDT, but this is based on like a myriad of different details internally. That said, understand the uh, frustration that can come with this, especially because everybody has lives, they're working, uh, they're doing, maybe not working, doing other things. So we are constantly iterating on this. Would love your feedback um, as we continue to share more. I know a couple of things we've done in the last few weeks, we've shared the date at which we are releasing on all the property cards. And then today, actually, we had a banner that stated the actual time we were releasing. So Jake actually put that up um, because of so much feedback that we've had from folks on the line. So um, we are, that's constantly iterating, looking how we can improve in the future. So definitely feel free to share feedback uh, as we continue to iterate. Appreciate you sharing. Um, one in here from Michael, has Arrived Homes explored, arrived, explored opportunities to purchase existing communities or build to rent? A builder builds a small community of 10 homes. Does Arrive look at these type of opportunities? Jeff, I'm going to kick that one over to you. Um, <clears throat> I don't think this kind of opportunity regularly crosses our, our desk, so to speak, but it's certainly something that we would look at. Um, I think, I, I think that, you know, at our current size committing to 10 homes, which we'd probably have to commit to all of them is, it would be a little bit of a stretch, but certainly as we, as we grow, as, as the number of investors grow, I think this is going to be a great thing that a great type of deal we could look at similar to our B2B that I, I went over in our presentation, our B2B partners. Um, 
that'll allow us to buy more homes with good returns, um, get economies of scale and, and deliver better returns to investors. So um, yeah, that kind of deal sounds, sounds interesting. Um, it just might be a little hard to execute today. Yeah, I think there's a mismatch right now between our size and what we do versus um, what Build for Rent is. If we had the intention to hold things into perpetuity, like hold it forever, Build for Rent makes sense. One of the issues is that we look for exits. So we want to sell the property on the market eventually, right? Because that's how you get your appreciation. That's how you actually get paid out um, on that component of it. So one of the challenges with Build for Rent is that you can't easily sell it because imagine that there's a community of 40 homes and they're all renters. It's going to be tough to get that first batch of people willing to go move into there as, as the homeowner. So they're not great investments when it comes to having a medium term exit option, right? They don't sell quite like you would, you know, I would prefer to be in a neighborhood where 85 to 90% own and 10 to 15% rent. There's a resale market there. So there's an exit. So I think that one of the things we've been contemplating as far as where can we participate in the construction economy? Well, it's continuing to do what we're doing, which is buying the inventory of um, smaller regional home builders. But I think there's also an opportunity to partner with them and buy more of their long-term inventory where we'll buy a couple units from many of their different communities that are coming out. Because that's more the spot where Arrive participates in terms of our individual properties is that given that the whole time is five to seven years, you need an exit. And where's the exit? It's got to be to the retail market usually. So if you have that kind of community where it's majority ownership, but you're getting the income for the meantime, great. Then you need the resale, you need the, the exit option to sell to some um, home buyer or maybe another investor, but at least you want the option of having the home buyer to have an exit with. Build for rent, that option is not available. So when we do get to the size, you know, we could view it much like multifamily. It's like multifamily, but instead of building up, you build out and you have separate walls. So it's like an expensive version of multifamily, but the economics of it might be very similar in that you're operating it more for a defensive cash flow for a longer period of time. Um, tax advantage, of course, with depreciation, all those sorts of you know nice uh, tax advantage benefits that you get from investing in real estate through depreciation um, and capital gains recapture. But uh, yeah, you know, it's... I, I've thought about it a lot because our our former company, American Homes for Rent, they very much participate in build for rent and they're really good at it, but they own forever. So it's a different, it's a different business model. I I did see one in here. I think it's a good follow-up before we move to the last two questions that we have. Um, is rent to own lease structures on arrived home, arrived map? Yeah, rent to own that like that's another um, interesting program. I think that one of the challenging aspects of rent to own um, is the exit, right? We need to be a little bit more in control of the exit because there are a lot of rent to own models out there. So there's Divi Homes. Um, there are a couple of other kind of prop tech startups that really bridge homeowners. Right? They bridge home ownership and that's what it is because they, they front the capital to buy the home that you want. Then you rent it for them plus some small down payment. And then there's some split that the rent may go towards down payment. It may go towards equity, some part for rent, some variation of that. But the, the exits are variable. So that means the, the, the renter slash you know, optional home buyer, like they may not choose to exercise. So there may not be an exit or they may choose to buy in year two, near three. So there's a measure of volatility and like lack of control that we have that's part of our current investment process that's like not super compatible with that today. But it doesn't mean that we can't move towards having a segment or an investment product that like mirrors that. But that is some of the complexity right now is that there is a an exit timeline that is not within our control sometimes. So, we just opt for more certainty because we're dealing with the sec we're dealing with security so we just need some more it's a it's better product for us to just be able to manage all the decisions 
Wonderful. Yeah, great question, Michael. Appreciate you walking through it, Cameron. We have two more before we close our virtual doors for the day. Under use of proceeds, property management improvements, the amount is usually in the five to seven K range amount, regardless uh, if it's a, a newer property or an older one. Does any unused portions go back to the property reserves or is this a set amount that considered an expense regardless of use? No, it's not an expense. It is capital. So it can be used for expenses and any leftover goes towards the cash reserve. So that cash stays with you all. Now we try to hone in on it. So it's best utilized because you don't want idle, you don't want excess idle cash sitting there doing nothing. That's, that's a bad use of it. So we try to thread the needle on it. And usually what that five to 7,000 covers is a refrigerator appliances, a lot of times blinds, because you'll be surprised by how many even resale homes where people lived in the four, no blinds. You know, they're just, go ahead, look in. So it's it's a bit surprising, but with that said, that that is a very common expense that we incur, as well as possibly a full fence, which you'll see more ten to fifteen thousand dollar budget because the wood is just. I'm surprised it hasn't come down yet, given the the lowering of construction activity. But you know, say la vie, you know the the commodity price is what it what is what it is. Um, so that appliances, blinds, even on new construction, you're going to have those types of costs. So that's kind of the baseline amount that we expect. But if we come in under, it goes all to the cash reserve. Wonderful. And I saw one in fair from Supreet. How do I sign up for text notifications? I'm going to drop one of our coming soon properties, the Brennan. You should see on the right hand side, there's a black box or at the bottom of the property card. You can click notify me. From there, you can choose either text or email alerts. If you'd like both, feel free to state that as well. Um, but that's notified. And then I do see one last one in here, Jeff, that I'm gonna kick over to you. Why don't you have any properties near downtown Atlanta in the cooler parts of town like Grant Park, Cabbage Town, et cetera? So <clears throat> I think we, you know, eventually may look down there for potentially a vacation rental or something. That might be interesting. Um, I think the more downtown parts of Atlanta just haven't historically really hit our buy box of the kind of homes that we look to purchase. Um, but I, I mean, again, it's it's not one of those things where we particularly avoid it. It's just the, again, the the types of property down there are going to be older builds, um, you know, not on the same kinds of lots. Uh, they might just have, they might have some more challenges, again, that don't really fit our traditional buy box. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly not opposed to buying something in kind of an infill location, especially when we would buy something that maybe is like a hardened home. So it's newer, it's been completely rehabbed, maybe a brand new home that they've kind of, you know, taken down the old building there and put a new one up. So certainly an interesting market. Awesome. And I'm seeing some great feedback in here regarding the banner that we shared today around timing. So we'll definitely be sure to share that with our team. As I mentioned with Tiffany earlier, we're constantly iterating. Feel free to share any feedback that you have uh, either here or support at arrive.com. I wanted to mention too, I just recently dropped a poll. So it's if arrive had an auto invest feature where we reserve shares in a property and give you 24 hours to confirm purchase. Uh, would you like that to be ex expected rental income and dividend expected property appreciation overall performance? So uh, expected div on there um, and appreciation location leverage all of them. Let us know. Uh, would definitely love to hear from you all and feel free to share any details in the chat. Uh, Cameron, Jeff, any closing remarks before we shut our virtual doors for the day? Uh, no, there, there's a. Uh... I was really impressed by all of y'all's questions. I love how the chat always just takes off. Um, so this is this is the best part of doing these webinars is getting to to talk to y'all about all this stuff. So really appreciate your time and and coming and um, hopefully we can solve a lot of the problems that have you know that we hear loud and clear from from investors. So yeah, always great to hop on one of these and uh, always great to see how how engaged uh, and excited our investors are uh, to talk to, to talk to us and and to work with you guys directly. So yeah, love it. Wonderful. Uh, for everybody on the line today, thank you so much for taking the time to attend. I so appreciate the kind words in here, Michael, uh, Victoria. Victoria is part of our team as well. AB, 
Uh, mahalo. We'd love to have you all. Uh, we are building forum by you. So keep the feedback coming our way. We absolutely love doing these webinars. Cameron and Jeff, thank you so much for your time walking through all the different questions and all the different angles. Definitely appreciate it. If you all have any questions, as we mentioned, feel free to ping support at arrive.com. Happy to chat. Otherwise, I hope you all great, have a great day and happy investing. Thanks, y'all. Thank have you. a great weekend. Take care. Bye.